I'm going to talk mostly about tubes, ways in which to get food, nutrition, medication into your child other than necessarily using your mouth the conventional way. And I wanted to first point out that there's a lot of different reasons to place a tube. Um, the most common reason that you'll hear, and many of you may have more experience with tubes than I'll ever have because you've already managed one with your children, but is if they can't eat by mouth. For whatever reason, if there's a problem chewing or if when they swallow it goes down into their lungs that they aspirate, then that's a good reason to bypass the mouth. But it's also true if it just takes them a really long time to chew. And if you wind up spending four or five hours a day trying to get in one meal, maybe you could use that time better doing something else and more fun and engaging. Um, you're, it's completely legitimate to do it if they're not gaining weight. If your child's losing weight, it's also used simply for medications. So if you have a child that has to take medications for any condition that taste bad, that they refuse to take or difficult to take or takes a long time to take, and classic for me is as an HIV provider is HIV. A baby with HIV might have to take three different yucky tasting medicines three times a day. And so often we could put in a tube just to get that in. There are all kinds of tubes, so it can go we can do it through the nose, through the mouth, through the stomach. We can go directly into the stomach. We can go into the intestines. And these are just some of the different terms that you may have heard or had. So oral gastric tube, nasogastric tube means nose to the stomach. Nasojejunal means nose to the intestine. Gastric tube is directly into the stomach. Then you could have a combo tube that goes into the stomach and the intestine or you could have one that goes directly into the intestine. The next slide just shows you some of the ways in which they would enter the body and where they would land. And the only reason I just wanted to talk about this for a split second is the nasogastric tube is really a short-term solution. So there's been very rare instances in my career of over 25 years where we would use that for more than 12 weeks, okay? And the reason being is that if, I mean, just imagine if you had a tube that went in your nose and then was hanging around in the back of your throat. It interferes with speech development. It interferes with swallowing. And it also creates an increased risk of potentially infection in the nasal passages or up in the sinuses because you've now got a little piece of plastic up there. So we can use it short term to prove that um, we can feed somebody with it. But if you've had a child with a nasogastric tube for several weeks and it's working, it would be best to transition to a gastric tube to kind of get their beautiful face cleared up and get it off of them. Okay, so there, we'll talk about G-tubes a little bit more because that's the most common one. Are you gonna help me? <laughs> um, and, and what are the advantages of feeding directly into the stomach or using it for med administration? Well, it most closely approximates oral feeding. Okay, if you have a gastric tube, you can give a meal quickly the same way that you could eat a meal quickly because you have the whole entire stomach that you can in insert it into. With a gastric tube, you can give real food. You can puree food and put it through or you can buy pureed foods that are meant to go through G-tubes. You could put in Oreos and milk through it as long as you can get it into the liquid form um, through the G-tube. If you have a G-tube, you can also vent. So if your child is having issues with gas or bloating or irritability, it's a little pop-off valve. It's not perfect, but sometimes it's nice to have that as a venting mechanism. Um, these tubes can be placed surgically or endoscopically. And then when you hear the word PEG, that simply means that the tube was placed with the assistance of an endoscopy. So the endoscopist uses their tube, goes into the stomach, finds a good place to put the tube, pokes a hole through the skin, and then basically puts the tube in place that way. What would be the disadvantages of having a gastrostomy tube? Well, a, a PEG procedure, as opposed to having a surgeon put the tube directly into the stomach, does have a slight increased risk of an infection in the inside of the abdomen or the peritoneum. Uh, especially if it gets dislodged immediately after it's placed. So when you first make the tube, um, what you're doing is you're taking, here, I'll go back one. When we're first putting in a tube, we're basically 
going to put a little balloon inside the stomach and then the outside part will be to the skin. And so when we're living and don't have a tube, our stomach isn't right next to the skin of our abdominal wall. When we do that, we create a tract and we kind of pull the stomach wall up against the skin wall. And over time that heals. And I always say it's kind of like if you have pierced ears. When you first get your ears pierced, that hole isn't healed and you have to twist it and wait till it heals. But after your ear piercing has lasted for a while, you can take that out and nothing happens. But if your ear piercing comes out in the first week or so, it's really hard to get it back in and it can get infected if you don't take good care of it. So, so it's kind of like an ear version of the same thing. But it, after it's been there for a while, the stomach kind of glues up against the abdominal wall and that tract stays there. And then that's nice because then you can change the tube easily without having to do a surgery. Okay, so now GJs. GJs are usually used in patients who are having bigger issues with tolerating feeds. So you'll hear about these in people who have severe vomiting or who have vomiting and a high risk of aspirating. And so we're trying to bypass the stomach to make it safer and easier to get nutrition in. And those are usually the times that we think about doing that. Then you wind up having a little bit more stuff on you because in a, in a GJ, you actually still go through the stomach, but then there's a skinny tube that extends beyond the original tube that snakes all the way down into the intestine. Downside to that is over time, they can snake their way out of the intestine and come up back into the stomach. And so then you haven't really bypassed the stomach. Um, the other issue is that our small intestine, unlike our stomach, can't expand to take a full meal in a few minutes. You can only give continuous feeds through a J-tube. You can't give a giant bolus feed. And you're also now bypassing the normal stomach acid that's available. So if there's some medications that need to go into the stomach and need to be exposed to acid to be activated, then they might still need to go into the stomach then instead of the J-tube. Um, there's a rare risk of a of blockage too. So sometimes that skinny little tube that's way down in the small intestine can get kind of twisted up and then create a blockage. So then if the patient starts having vomiting, big stomach distension, even vomiting with venting, then you might have to think, oh, this has caused a kink or a blockage. All right, now here's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? The good tube is the one up in the far corner, right? You have the tube and there's no issues. It looks beautiful. It's just normal skin around it and everything is fine. But, and, and we can never predict who is gonna have problems with a tube when we put one in. But some kids and people have problems with their tubes. The most common problem is the one in the upper right, thank you, which is granulation tissue. We're gonna talk about that. But then there's other, a couple of really bad things like infections and prolapse that we're gonna talk about also. Just so that if you have somebody in your family with a tube and you see this, you'll say like, oh, that's the thing I need to go call the doctor about. Okay, so granulation tissue. So what is this? So this is basically scar tissue that grows right at the spot where the tube goes through the skin into the stomach. It is basically like excess tissue. It's usually pink. In this picture, for instance, it almost looks a little warty-like on the edge. Um, it can bleed easily when you rub up against it. Um, it can be bubbly and puffy, and it can just come, and it can go away on its own. Um, the best treatment, if you start to see something like that, is just to clean it and dry it. Um, but there are medication ointments like triamcinolone cream that can be put just on the extra pink tissue and it'll, it usually can melt it away. Um, and then if, in the worst case scenario, if it doesn't go away then, your doctor can treat it with silver nitrate, which will just kind of burn it off. And I see nodders, so they've probably even done it themselves. That's right. <laughs> um, how can, can you prevent granulation tissue? Well, the belief is that the granulation tissue, part of it is the person. So the, per, the people who have a predisposition to develop scar tissue are gonna more likely have granulation tissue. But some of it is the rubbing and irritation around the tube. So if you have a button or a tube, having a snug fit without a lot of movement around the tube, will hopefully help reduce some of that. So if it's a balloon tube, 
you know, make sure that your internal balloon is filled appropriately. If you get a new button and it's really long or sticking out and moving a lot, that might increase the likelihood that your granulation tissue will come back. Um, keeping the site clean and dry all the time, which I know can be very challenging in a leaky tube or a tube that has a lot of discharge, but the more that skin is clean and dry, free to air, not bunched up with wet dressings, uh, washed daily, it'll decrease the likelihood of developing it. Um, and the same with the creams and ointments. Use what your doctors advise you to use because if you're putting a lot of gunk on it, it could be making it worse. Um, okay, infection. So if you have lots of granulation tissue and skin breakdown, then bacteria that lives on, your, on the skin can get into the tissue right there and create an infection. So this is an example of an, a cellulitis. This is different than simple granulation tissue and you'll know it when you see it because first of all, it hurts if you touch it. It'll feel warm or hard and it might smell bad or it might even have pus or drainage coming from it. Um, Sometimes if there's a lot of moisture, you can also get a yeast rash, just like diaper rash around the tube if there's been lots of moisture. So sometimes it could be bacterial and sometimes it can be a, a yeast type infection. And so if you're not sure, make sure that you either take a picture and show the doctor or bring them to the doctor and make sure you get the right treatment. This, let's see, I think my next slide's treatment, yes. So a mild infection sometimes can just be with topical antibiotics, but if it's starting to get into the tissue, the child might need to take antibiotics by mouth or through the tube. And in a worst case scenario, if it was really bad, even briefly IV antibiotics. Um, and then if they thought that it was candida or fungus, then maybe a different type of ointment. Um, again, prevention of this is, the, is basically the same as the prevention of the granulation tissue, which is always keeping the area clean, including washing your hands with soap and water every time you handle the tube and you clean the tube every day, and the site around the skin open and free, always to air whenever possible. Um, let's see, and per, yeah, and so, and so one of the other things too is, if you have a leaky tube, and we'll talk a little bit about leakage, and the, what's coming out is acidic, that acid is gonna burn the skin, and then that breakdown of the skin is gonna increase the risk of infection. So leakage, right? It's normal for a small amount of leakage, but leakage can sometimes become the biggest quality of life problem with a tube. If you have one that's leaking all the time and then your kid's shirt is wet all the time and you have to buy special drains and I mean, uh, dressings to put around the tube. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you have the best possible fit to try and manage that leakage. Um, and remember that the answer to a tube that's leaking is not a bigger tube. So again, I'm going back to your earrings, right? We all know that if you keep putting something bigger and bigger in your ear, you could wind up with those nice big holes in your ear. Well, the same thing's gonna happen here. If you keep putting a bigger and bigger tube to deal with leakage, you're just gonna keep getting a bigger and bigger hole. Okay, so the, so the trick to managing the leakage is actually the integrity of the skin around the tube, decreasing the acid in the stomach if there is acidic leakage, and trying to get the best, most appropriate fitting tube that's not wiggling around. All right, now prolapse. The, uh, this is really scary looking, and I just put it up there because if it were to happen, you need to know that this is different than granulation tissue, it's different than infection, and it really is an emergency. This ha is most likely to happen in cases where a tube has been dislodged a lot, so there's been a lot of trauma to the tube. Maybe the child that rolls around a lot or is roughhousing with a sibling and it gets keep getting yanked out traumatically. What can happen is that the lining of the stomach flops out a little bit. And the concern is that that lining of stomach then may not get enough blood supply and need to be operated on. So that's why I show this and show that it, you know, if you see that, it looks different and it would really require going to the doctor immediately. It's, it's rare, but it happens. And it's more likely to happen when there's tube trauma or more likely to happen if there's a lot of increased abdominal pressure, so a lot of coughing, straining, um, or if there's been a lot of breakdown around the edge of the tube. 
okay, clogging. So this is what we'll get called for. You know, we want to get everything through the tube. So we crush meds and we put foods through it or whatever. And sometimes after we've had the tube for a while, we get a little lazy about how much we flush it in between uses. And then you wind up with something that looks like concrete in your tubing. So the, the important thing to remember is flush it. Flush it a lot. Use a lot of water. Now most of the tubing is clear. So if you've used it for anything, you should flush it with enough water so that the tube looks perfectly clear again. Okay. Um, let's see. There are certain things that cannot be crushed and that cannot go through a tube, so make sure you've always checked with your pharmacist that what you're putting through the tube is appropriate for being crushed or put through the tube. Use at least an ounce of water after a dose of medications. And when you're crushing things that are allowed to be crushed, make sure you mix them in a good at least five cc's of water or more. Okay, and what can you do to fix one? So this is, the main reason I'm showing this is the things that even I was taught when I was training in medicine, you're not supposed to do. So we're not supposed to use soda. We're not supposed to use juice. Do not use really, really hot water. All of those things will actually affect the integrity of the tube and make it potentially crack or not last as long. So the, the way you're supposed to deal with it is take warm water and a large bore syringe and work it in and out like a plunger to see if you can get it to give Give, to get some give and then to get it through. And then if not, then you'll just have to see your GI team and ask them to replace the tube or use your own replacement if you have one. Um, let's see, that's it. so that's it for my slides about tubes, just to say that they can really be life altering. They could improve your life, whether it's struggling with meds, struggling with feeds, um, struggling with meds and feeds, worrying about choking, all of those things can can be great. They can be a headache sometimes, but more often than not, they can be just something that would really make things a lot easier um, if you need them. So with that, I'm going to stop the lecture part and then take any questions about GI issues. is not in with us right now, but we have a mom who's got a 30-year-old daughter, Chandler. I think she's in her, she's in her 30s. Uh -huh. She's had the button for a long time. And it's keyholed recently. And she was wondering what you know, your typical recommendation would be. Does she just have to move sites? Or what, what can she do? Yeah, so if you wind up having a complication like a prolapse or an early dislodge or a real extension of problem, if you have the real estate in an, in an adult, you probably have a little more room. Sometimes the best option is just to go to a completely new location. Yeah. I'll also take questions that are GI general. They don't have to be just tubes. When Julie first got the button in 1990, we were told because she has a colostomy underneath, just to be on the safe side, to put a four by four, that's uh, non-stickable, so that if a bag opened, that would stop it from trying to go in the stomach at the same time. Mm -hmm. Should we still do that? Because you just said that you know we should leave it open. But because she has a colostomy, maybe we should just do what we're doing, or? Well, how much space is there between oh, the two stomas? Oh, not much. I'm talking like where the wafer is, the, is finished and her, two, her, her stoma for the G-tube, it's probably two inches, three inches. And how often in your experience have you had spillage from the colostomy that oh, stain her abdomen? A lot. A not lot. so much lately because we put a belt on her now, mm -hmm. but we used to get a lot. So it's more preventative, but she hasn't had any problems with the tube. We had to get a new, uh, a new uh, site made mm -hmm. a few years back, but with this one, it's been fine. It's been fine. And does it get moist underneath the four by four? I mean, like, no. so the key, the problem that I see is when you start jamming stuff under a bolster or in and under the tube. If you're put, if you're covering, the, it's a button and you're just covering the whole button when you're not using it, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. As long as it's not getting moist and gunky no, in and there. No, change it like four times a day. Yeah, oh no, that's, 
that's brilliant. It's, it's, it's a lot of times what will happen is with the leakage is people will start shoving stuff between the bolster and the skin, and that just creates more pressure to increase the size of the leakage and traps the moisture to cause the skin breakdown. But you're just trying to protect it from collateral debris. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> common is it for to have to get a different size button in the kids? Um, Ellie's had hers since she was six months old. She's now 28. Um, I do notice that um, it looks like it's moving around more. Mm -hmm. And so what, I mean, like, should... Right. So, so let's talk, there's two ways in which, we'll, we'll talk a button, right? It, yeah, like she it's has a, a button. Mickey. Yeah, a Mickey. No. A bard. A bard. But it's a button. It's not, it's there's no tube right. sticking out. There's a cap yeah, that you no. hook. Right. Yeah. So if they, if that's called a skin level device or a button. And basically, regardless of the brand, there's two pieces that are the size. There's the French size, which is how big around the right. tube is. Mm -hmm. And then there's the length, which is the centimeters. Yeah. So I should have been clear yeah. when I was saying not use a bigger tube, I meant not use a fatter tube okay. when you're leaking right? But the length of your tube will change and need to be changed based on whether or not the person's gaining weight or growing or not, oh, yeah, or, lose, not or, but, or losing weight. So if you have a period of time of weight loss, your tube could become too long. I, I want to say hers is a 15 French, mm -hmm. one point, or 18 French, 1.5. Right. And it's been that since she was six months old. And, and how much is her weight chained? Uh, she's just under 60 pounds. Right yeah. Now. So, I, I mean, if she's weight stable and that's not changing and it's working, it's fine. What you want for a good fit is, so it has a balloon on the inside, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want the balloon on the inside when filled to the way it's prescribed five, to be filled, right, with five, five mLs, yeah. you want it so that the cap is flush and that there's not a lot of play. You, and we you, have play. You have a lot of play? Not a lot of play, but... Um, I, they they done... come in half centimeter sizes, okay. right? So the, sh the next size down, instead of a 1.5, would be a 1. Okay. So that might be too tight. Yeah. We, um, I actually was just showing them. I, I went to Etsy uh -huh. and bought, they call them G-tube covers. Yeah. And, they're, and it's, they're just little round... The little decorative ones. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, they're flannel on one side and cotton on the other. And we've started using those because when she goes to her day program, they're not real good. When they feed her, they let things drip and they don't clean it up as well. So I, I put that on her when she goes there mm -hmm. so that I know that it's staying as dry as possible. Yeah, and that's but, okay. But again, it, but you just wouldn't want to put a pad on like that that would then get wet and stay there for a whole day or have them sleep all night with a, with a wet thing right. stuck to it. But if you're putting it on just for them to go to protect it, and then you check it and dry it later. Yeah, I, we switch them out. She, I, we go through maybe three a day. You know, yeah. We, we switch them out. But, but it has helped tremendously with the redness around the stoma. Yeah. So. Good. Any other questions? I have a quick oh, question. Yeah. Um, I know um, when the kids have feeding tubes, us parents want them off of the feeding tube as soon as possible. Um, do you recommend any feeding therapy companies that our families could reach out to? I know of one called Clinic for Kids. Um, that's the company that um, helped us out of California. So I don't know if there's different ones around the United States that could help behaviorally train them to, yeah. to eat. So, so I'm not familiar with those, but thank you for giving that information. So I do want to make one comment about the issue of transitioning back. If, so uh, many times if a tube is put in in very early infancy, and by early infancy, I mean first few months of life. Yeah. It's possible that those children will not learn the normal connection between pleasure of eating and the act of eating. And so that's where you could require significant behavioral work to get them to transition to oral feeding. If you have a child who has been eating fantastically by mouth and loves to eat and is five or six years old, but now you're having other issues that require a tube, it's, the child may eat less by mouth after the tube's put in because you're giving them food, but they won't necessarily forget 
or lose that link between the kind of joy that we all know that means see food, eat food, feel happy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some of us wish we could lose that, but, <laughs> but we can't. Um, so yeah, it can be a struggle to, to really do that. And I, I think it's, it's partnering with either your gastroenterologist, their nutrition support team, or your um, physical therapy OT specialist. But, I, I, but if you know of specific companies that'll work with that, that's great to know as a resource also. So my question is a GI question. Um, my son had the Nissen fund application surgery when he was four months old, and that's when they took the NG tube and put the G tube in. He's 11 now, and he's about to be 12. My question is, can that fundo become undone? Because recently he has started vomiting, which we weren't seeing a, a bunch of vomit. Like before when he would vomit, it would only be maybe a small handful. It's like poltergeist in the house, all over the place. So how does that happen? Right, so, so this is a really great question. And so the first part to the, your question is, yes, a fundo can come undone. In fact, most fundos eventually become undone. Uh, what the fundoplication does is it takes the top part of the stomach We'll go back to my stomach picture because I'm a visual person. Okay. So when you have a fundoplication, what the doctors do in a surgery is they take that little extra skin, up, little extra part of the stomach up there, and they create a wrap around the esophagus, the tube that you swallow down, and they essentially tighten it up to make it harder. So you can still swallow down, but it makes it almost impossible to throw up. They do that with a few stitches and then some scar tissue creates that. However, the act of retching is really violent. And the only reason I know that is because I've been in somebody's stomach scoping while they were retching. And you, when you see it up close, it's like, wow. The whole entire stomach squeezes and almost comes up through the esophagus when you vomit. So, so if you're retching and retching and retching against a fundoplication over time, it'll loosen up or slip or come undone. So, so if he's vomiting now, it probably means that there's some part of it might still be intact. It might still be a little tighter than it would have been if he'd never had the surgery, but it's chances are it's undone. So, so if, if that becomes a big issue, again, you, you can redo a fundo. It, it just depends on how much of a problem it is. Maybe with having the G-tube and venting and him being older, vomiting will be less of a problem. The other way around it is converting to a GJ. So if it's that all the feeds are coming up and you go past the stomach, so you have, you have your G, and then they could, through that, put an additional tube that would come down here when you feed or give meds down here, they don't accumulate in the stomach. And so you could still vomit your stomach juice, but you wouldn't be vomiting the feeds that are going down further. Yeah. Here, I'll give you a mic. When Kevin had his um, Nissen done, he was like 10 months old. They told us he would outgrow it. Not kind would, I don't think he has because he doesn't vomit, but, and he did retch. After the surgery, he had dry heaves for probably a year. Yeah. Because I didn't know if it was a learned behavior. No, I, I think it's what's happening is you just are responding to having the Nissen. You know, the, the other thing, yeah, the other thing that I always remind people about is sometimes it's really good to vomit, right? And, and it probably won't be an issue for your son, but, there are children who get Nissens who then become teenagers who go out and, oh, I don't know, drink alcohol, maybe more than they should. And then they can't throw up when they're drinking alcohol because they might not have a G-tube either. And then they wind up in an emergency room because somebody has to put a tube down to get the alcohol out of their stomach. <laughs> so, so, so sometimes vomiting is a good, and the same with food poisoning. You know, if you eat some bad shrimp and you have a fundo, you're not going to feel good because you're not necessarily going to be able to throw it up. Um, no, but I think more outgrow it than not. So I've... 
Right, and he's had it for how many years? Oh, yeah. That's a pretty long time. That might be the longest one I've ever heard of lasting. But we also do Nissen's in adults, too. There's some conditions in adults where we would do a fundoplication, and, you know, and they can last for years. When Ellie had hers done, she was um, almost seven months old. Um, they told me at that point that they were doing a partial wrap. So what, what is the difference between a partial and a full wrap? So um, the, the way it would be described in the surgical note is if you think about it, the opening of the, from the esophagus into the stomach is a circle. So how much they wrap around in degrees, so 360 degrees would be a full wrap. A partial wrap goes a little less than 360 degrees, and often they'll do those because they'll feel like they can get the least amount of retching and discomfort, but still effectively significantly reduce vomiting. <laughs> And then she was throwing up. She outgrew the vomiting, you mean? Yeah. Right. Oh, here's somebody with that needs a mic because they can't get up. <laughs> okay, so my son here, Dakota, got his G tube at six days old. And he vomited at 30 days, and we thought he had aspirated because he got a Nissen also. However, when we spoke to our PEDS team, they said it's less likely that he would vomit, but he still could vomit. Is your opinion the same as that? Um, yes. That, I mean, you can, okay, let me think. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and come up with like a, an estimate. Of all the children that I've ever seen in my entire career that had a Nissen, something between 75 and 85 percent could vomit. So both my boys have G-tubes. My oldest, who is nine, got his at 11 weeks. So he has never been able to vomit. And when he started vomiting, I was scared to death because I thought he had aspirated. So, because I was always told when he, my oldest got his G-tube, never going to be able to vomit, never going to be able to vomit. And then three years later, I have one vomiting, it scared the living you know what out of me. So, so, so the, the important thing to remember about that is what, so the risk that you're worrying about is not the vomiting, but the aspirating, right? The stuff going down into their lungs. And what determines whether or not that's likely to happen is more how they would perform on a swallow test, right? And so have, have they had swallow tests? And do they pass or no? They fail. Oh. Right, and so, and that's kind of why I, I didn't even talk about Nissen's, um, and maybe I should have included it, because the, a, a Nissen, a G-tube, a GJ-tube, none of them can 100% eliminate the risk of aspiration, right? Because you have stuff being made in your mouth. <laughs> so that liquid is gonna be swallowed, and then anything that gets in their mouth is gonna be swallowed. And the other thing that we didn't talk about too is if a Nissen is really tight, the spit and fluid that you swallow can accumulate in your esophagus. And then you can be kind of gurgling and you know, it sounds like they're almost drowning in their own spit because the Nissen was too tight. So the surgeons are, especially in little ones, are really walking a very fine line. They're trying to make it tight enough to make it safe but not so tight that they're having symptoms or that their own spit is gonna get caught up in their esophagus. So uh, it sounds like you had like a 50-50 experience like <laughs> in terms of you know, when they were done. And, it, and again, they could do a redo if you really felt like it was becoming a big problem. I'll stay for a few, st I mean, if people have individual questions too, but I know you all have been here a really long time. <laughs> but I appreciate your attention and I hope I've answered your questions. Okay.
that's fine. 